Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word, and it is my privilege to introduce Adolfo Potts. I could tell you a lot about him. Um, I know him very well. Uh, he's uh, with us this summer. Uh, we're blessed to have him home for a short period of time uh, as he is uh, in Weimar. And uh, Diane, your story went uh, very well with the, uh, with the message of the hour. Um, the length, um, a deeper look at true education, and um, Adolfo, it's time for you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning. Um, it is awesome to be back and here again with everybody. And uh, it's amazing how many things uh, you know, change. Uh, my little brother and sister can uh, do that awesome duet. Uh, I remember back in when I was still in college, um, Last semester, I was like, Mom, you really need to you know, put them in violin and cello, and I think it'd be great. And now they're already playing with each other. I think they put that together in a few days. I was like, wow, that is truly a gift of God. So uh, as many of you know, I, am, I went to Watch the Hills, and I am currently at Weimar College. And at both of these schools, there's a really heavy emphasis on true education. And when I went to Watch the Hills, you know, I was pretty fresh, didn't really know uh, much about this. I mean, of course, you hear about it in church, when you read about it in uh, Mrs. White books. And when I went there, and when I went to Watch the Hills, I got to understand a little bit more of true education through experience. You know, we had to work in the garden, you know, we had an intense uh, schedule for school and you know of course we have the very awesome spiritual environment in which we cultivate and the students grow spiritually and then I went to Weimar which also does the same thing and uh, just recently I took a class called uh, philosophy of Christian education and it was in this class we read uh, Mrs. White's book uh, education an awesome book and I learned a lot of awesome stuff and I believe it was either last Sabbath or the Sabbath before that, uh, Mr. Kent talked about, uh, he gave a little bit of a brief synopsis on education and you know the way it should be. And that got me thinking, I said, well, I did write a research paper on, on education, so maybe I could you know, tweak it a little bit and make it into a sermon. So um, today I'll be talking about education and true education and uh, some of the aspects of it. and. I am, a, I haven't spoken in a while, so I may not wax as eloquent as some of the awesome preachers you guys have here, but I shall try to explain the subject to the best of my ability. Before I begin, I'd just like to have one more quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together, and uh, Lord, I just ask that you would uh, be with me, and uh, that you would Give me the words to speak, that they be not of my own, but the things that you have given that I present, and uh, help me to uh, present it in the most effective manner, and for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, the link. Quite an interesting subject, or a title, I should say. Um, but... Today I would just like to talk to you a little bit about true education. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Um, we're going to be talking about the aspects of true education, what they entail, and 
how they are actually intertwined with one another. You know, most people think of education as, you know, I'm going to school, you know, or, or um, I'm in Sabbath school, or for those of us like who had to work in the gardens and, and really do all that stuff, you know, physical education. But I like to show how they actually complement one another. So in today's world, knowledge is pretty much gained through learning and education, right? Um, you go to school, you learn, and for knowledge, some people have gone to great lengths to gain this, and knowledge, people who have knowledge are looked at with a lot of respect. And because of this, the children are then encouraged to become the best, to have the most education necessary. So the children are placed into this arena of education, if you will. And I'm sorry, I was gonna have slides, but for some reason, uh, uh, it was completely my fault. I didn't bring the right computer. So uh, I did have all this stuff up here, but it didn't work out. So you'll see me looking down a lot. But they're placed into this arena of education and are encouraged to become the best of the best. You know, Timmy, you're gonna go to kindergarten, you're gonna go all the way to 12th grade, and then you're gonna go to college, you're gonna be really good there, and then I want you to go to medical school, uh, school of law, you know, whatever it may be, and become the best. And the children have this mentality ingrained in them, even from, you know, very young age. And instead of education being something that's, that's wonderful where you learn about the things that God created, you know, of nature, you know, the spiritual things, practical things, it becomes more of, you know, just an all-out war zone, you know, you, have, you hear about kids, you know, oh, I got you know, such and such a grade on such test, or, you know, I did this, and sometimes you'll be hear parents talking about it, and this really encourages and just feeds that competitive atmosphere. And I believe that education is much more than that. God designed education to be something meaningful, something wonderful, something that can encourage us physically, mentally, and spiritually. So when you think of education, what comes to mind? Give me some, give me some feedback. Books, yes. Books tests, yes, tests. A few of those things, knowledge, Getting smart, oh yes, there we go. Um, some of the things that I jotted down, very similar, you know, you have school, you have you know, homework, uh, you have um, learning new information and getting a degree and uh, money, uh, whether that be the expending of money or the receiving of money, it's both in there as well. And we often think of gaining the raw, uh, factual information, memorizing this stuff, getting it ingrained into you. Um, but often in the drive for this, for the facts, the factual education, we often, most of the students get caught up in, you know, getting, since they're getting caught up in being the best, you know, this affects their, their methods, it affects their morals, how they do it, um, it affects their well-being. And some children, when uh, they can't remember a test question, it's pretty tempting to look over at, at Johnny's paper and you know, kind of get some of that over there. Or maybe they are staying up all night studying for this next test that you have the next day. Really not good for your physical well-being. And of course, God doesn't condone us ignoring the other aspects of education, such as our body. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 6.19, he says, what, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, that you have of God, which is not your own? And also, one other thing, do you think that some of these students, when they're attempting, when they have this singular focus, are they thinking about God? Are they taking the time to do devotions, maybe encouraging that, uh, the spiritual education? So when we look at modern society, I think it's pretty fair to say that we are a relatively education-driven society. We want to learn to be educated. And the sole purpose of life in some people is to be educated. And therefore, a lot of time and effort is dedicated to this and all other things are pushed aside. But I'd like to bring up a question here. 
And uh, that is, could there be a reason for uh, the way that God designed education? Did he have, uh, where, what, was, what is the reasoning behind this? So we'll be exploring about that. And I really didn't know much about this topic. And as I began to look into it and explore into it, I found a lot of interesting things, which I hope that you all will find interesting as well. So I'd like to read to you a statement that's found in the book of education, really solid. And I don't know how many of you are at Ford Design Camp Meeting, but uh, we had a pastor board there who was talking. And I really, uh, it really interested me how he talked so much about whenever he was looking at something, he would go to the beginning, right? Go to the very origin. And so I would like to uh, do the same as well. And it really works. Um, in education, uh, page 20, she says, the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom, nature was the lesson book, and the creator himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. Just imagine adults, the students. It's kind of, you know, different role there, but something that God took an interest in was their education. But it wasn't just any education, it was the biblical, solid, true education. So I just like to pull your attention to some of the details that happened in the garden. And from here, we're going to identify the aspects of education. In the Garden of Eden, what did they do? What, tell me a little bit of what, what, you think, what you think, by looking at the Garden of Eden, what may have been some of the aspects that we're going to be talking about? Gardening, there we go, physical. That was the physical, tending to the garden, uh, the animals, definitely. Mm -hmm. There we go, that was definitely the mental side of it. You know, imagine naming all the animals. You know, we, we say, oh, you know, that must have been easy, a bear, cat, dog, a sheep, goat, lion, uh, that's nothing. But he had to start from scratch. He didn't even know anything. He was like, I can just imagine him just sitting there like, don't know. Think about it, you know, just, just thinking about it. He had, he really taxed uh, the mental aspect. Anything else? The intricate learning, the intricate learning is on how the plants and the animals moved and lived and, and had their beings. Absolutely. Anatomy and physiology of the plant and animal kingdom. Incredible. Biology, botany, yes? We already said physical, but I couldn't imagine the, the garden being a small little plot. Absolutely. I could imagine it being a very uh, large place where they had to walk and get to different places. Absolutely. For us, it would seem a daunting task, but for somebody who is at the peak of their uh, physical, mental, and spiritual uh, at the very peak of that, it must have been, you know, just something to do, you know, just tending to the garden, walking across the entire length of the garden, I can imagine. Interesting. One other thing, God was in constant communion with them, right? Just as um, my sister mentioned here is that God was always communicating with them. They were always communicating with God. There you have that spiritual aspect that we talked about. So those are the aspects that I like to talk to you about. And I had this really little a slide that kind of broke it down, but uh, I won't get to look at that. Um, so you have spiritual you have the mental, and then you have the physical aspect of education. And today we're really going to be talking about those things, really breaking them down into something that, what is, how are they, how are they linked, how are they interwined, and so forth. So, so let's take a look at the spiritual aspect of education. Let's start out with that first. It's definitely a very important aspect, correct? You know, it's very important to constantly be in God's Word, talking to Him, communicating with Him. But I must ask the question, why did God incorporate this as an aspect of education, as an aspect of true education, not just something that we're supposed to do, you know? And uh, I know it may be kind of a silly question, but when you're thinking about these things, you really got to break it down. So, 
when we read the Bible, as I was thinking about this, this question came to mind. When we read the Bible, what do we come to learn? Who are we learning about? In specific, what? We're learning about God, plan of redemption, absolutely. Anything else? Something specific? His role for us, us, yes. Hmm? His His will for us, yes. And all of these things describe what? His love, in specific, his character. We are, when we read the Bible, everything about the Bible tells us about God's character. We see he was a master designer, created the garden. He's a God of order, the way that he organized the Israelites in their exodus. We can see how he's someone with infinite wisdom, the wisdom, the, just a small amount, I can imagine the small amount of wisdom that he gave to Solomon made him the most uh, the smartest man that lived. He's a God of wisdom. You can see that in his creation as well. The intricate design of the human body, flowers, animals, and of course, love. You can find that everywhere in the Bible, reading about that. John 3.16, Romans 5.5. Many of these verses and everything about the Bible describes that he's a God of love. And It is his character that we want reflected in our lives, right? So, I'd just like to pull your attention to when Jesus was on earth, the perfect life that he lived. We also must live that life as well, right? And we have to obtain the character that Christ had because it was only because of the communication that he had with his heavenly father and the character that he had that allowed him to live a perfect and a sinless life. So we in the last days must also obtain the character of Christ so that we might be sinless in the eyes of God as well. So our spiritual education solidifies our character. We see this in Jesus when he was sitting at his mother's knee. She was reading the scriptures to him. He was constantly involved with the scriptures. And he had a very solid Christian education, and therefore he grew up into a man of character. And I've heard a lot of people say, um, you know, well, I am the way that I am now. I'm never going to change. I'm going to be this way forever. And it's interesting to see how the scriptures can take a person with a soiled character and completely transform him into somebody that is unrecognizable to others who may have known him in the past. And spiritual education plays a large role in doing that. And uh, just as we were mentioning before, you know, we see so many school shootings, you know, all these terrible, terrible things. I believe that it, one, of the, one of the core principles that are being left out is the spiritual education. We are not developing the character in our young people from a very young age. And that's why it is so critical why in the first school, which is the Adventist home, that all of these things should be developed and ingrained into the children. That way, when they do go out into these other environments, if it isn't possible to homeschool or whatever the case may be, they have that solid spiritual education. So let's take a look at uh, another example. I like to think of, besides Jesus, who is obviously our role model and everything, I would like to look at Timothy. In the spirit of prophecy, Uh, Acts of the Apostles, uh, she says that the word of God was the rule by which these two godly women, his mother and grandmother, guided Timothy. The spiritual power of the lessons that he received from them kept him in pure speech and unsullied by the evil influences with which he was surrounded. Thus his home instructors had cooperated with God in preparing him to bear burdens. Paul saw that Timothy was faithful, steadfast, and true. And she goes on to say that Timothy was a mere youth when he was chosen by God to be a teacher. But his principles had been so established by his early education that he was fitted to take his place as Paul's helper. So right here, we can clearly see the impact that spiritual education has on the individual. In Jesus, in Timothy, and I'd just like to ask a quick question. 
Um, these people, Paul, uh, Timothy, um, Jesus, were they, were they smart people? Were they, were they, were they knowledgeable? Absolutely. About Jesus, it says, never a man spoke like this man. Nobody knew how he could take the scriptures and explain them in such a practical yet knowledgeable way. Truly a genius of his time. Also, Timothy, we saw how he was fitted to take the role of Paul as a teacher. And Paul was a spiritual giant as a teacher. He was like the PhD of the spiritual world. He really knew his stuff. And yet Timothy, a youth, was fitted to take his place. I just find that incredible. I remember, uh, I can't remember his name, but one of the speakers in, uh, at Ford Design, he said, uh, Timothy got his GED. He, got, he was a God-educated disciple. That was, that was awesome. I really like that. Um, actually, the Apostles, it was uh, page 203. So as I was looking into, um, this is from uh, my paper that I wrote, I was uh, looking into some research. I just wanted to see if it's, just see what the impact spiritual education has on children, individuals, and so forth. And I found one in the Journal of Education in Urban Society. It was a study done on several children who were non-religious, who were uh, religious, and then like Christian and Protestant type based faiths. And they actually found that those who were Christians actually did better than all the other uh, groups, both the non-religious and those who didn't use the Bible as part of their faith. So it's just something that I found that was interesting. And I wonder why, you know, in the Christian faith, we have so many people who memorize scripture, who read the scripture so often. And memorization is so important, especially for the mind. It exercises the mind, expands the uh, abilities of the minds. Very important. And also, it impa- since it impacts character, these students have the character of Christ, right? So they have perseverance, diligence, determination, integrity, all of these things that are beneficial towards their mental education. And they also cultivate, most importantly, a dependence on God. You have an outlet. You can talk to God whenever you're feeling stressed, lonely. Uh, I remember so many times in uh, Weimar, you know, you have a big test for the next day, or, you know, you have this big long paper to write, like this one, and you're like, I just, I can't keep doing this. I'm just so stressed out right now. I've got so many things to do. And you can just talk to God, and, and he'll give you the strength to continue to push forward. So I can see how spiritual education really influences and is linked to mental education. They shouldn't be separate. It's all interwines. So uh, a simple question is, uh, what is education without the vital component of spiritual education. And uh, Mrs. White says, when the word of God is laid aside for books that lead away from God and that confuse the understanding regarding the principles of his kingdom of heaven, the education given is a perversion of the name. It's not even education. It's just perversion. And she goes on to say that if God's word was studied as it should be, Men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, a stability of purpose that is rarely seen in these times. The search for truth will reward the seeker at every turn, and each discovery will open up richer fields for his investigation. Incredible. Definitely linked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't separate those at all. Um, that was, the first one was, um, I believe is Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, uh, 15, page 15. And uh, the last one was CSA, page 69. All right. So now I'd like to move on to the other aspect of education. I'll really, I know that, I know that we need to kind of move forward. I'm kind of you know, getting delayed a little bit. So, um, what are some of the predominant 
hindrances of our day, especially in the field of, you know, the brain, you know, mental hindrances, you might say, for the student, for other individuals, doesn't even have to be a student. Um, I found that that was something that was really high up on the statistics was stress. A lot of people have stress in their lives. Students, always stressing, whether it be assignments, whatever it may be. Um, even people who aren't students, you know, the stress of life is you know, definitely something you've got to cope with. And uh, results showed that about 73% of Americans regularly experience psychological symptoms of stress. Another 76% of Americans experience physiological symptoms due to stress. And, and by the way, at Weimar, we're learning all about you know, how these things are connected. It's so incredible how the mind can actually impact the body physiologically. So uh, good to keep that brain in peak condition. And 33% uh, of Americans claim that they are living with extreme stress. Now, that's, that may not sound like a lot, but that's actually a lot. 33% extreme stress. And I think it's very fair to say that it's a pretty common problem, stress. And uh, so what did God give us to help us deal with the mental taxation of the brain? What, what aspect of education did he give us as an outlet? Physical education, exactly. And without physical education, you know, when, you, when stress builds up, you get all these things such as depression, anxiety, and all these things are, lead to a whole host of other things that I really don't have time to go into. So it's just, you know, it's definitely good to have that outlet of physical education. And in, uh, there was actually a study done, and it says uh, this, I believe his name was Andreas Strolli, he said that physical inactivity is associated with the development of mental disorders. Clinical epidemiological studies have shown an association between physical activity and symptoms of depression. And I know everybody knows that if you're inactive, it's definitely going to impact the way you think, the stress levels, everything. This is kind of, um, this is just really important stuff, um, especially when you're impacting the brain. So let's look at the life of Jesus. How did Jesus cope with stress? Prayer. Exactly. Um, what else? Uh, even, even before his, uh, his life of ministry, what, what did he do? Um, he sang. He spent a lot of time in nature, right? Exactly. Walking. I mean, he walked everywhere he went, right? <laughs> um, and uh, definitely communication with his father. And I just want to bring you to a point where Jesus was suffering extreme stress. And I believe that we could all agree that that was during, that would, first of all, the, there were two points actually. It was in Gethsemane, and then when he was being tempted of the devil in the wilderness. And uh, how did he deal with uh, both of these? Just something I wanted to bring out that actually goes back to our previous topic, and that was scripture consistently quoting scripture. So spiritual education can also impact the mind as well in a beneficial way, help you relieve some of that stress. And also, what else did he do? He was also in nature, consistently, um, you know, meditating with his father in nature. And I found a really interesting study, and I didn't put it in my notes, but I did have it... Um, up here, let me just fast forward a little bit. Um, here it is. A study done by uh, Mr. Kaplan in 1995, he found that simply being in nature, you didn't even have to do anything, just being in nature, it helped to relieve mental fatigue. And also with people who were um, recovering from, in outpatient care from surgery and so forth, they recovered better if they were in nature, if they were exposed to natural environments. And I just found that really interesting. So um, God definitely had a purpose for nature, putting Adam and Eve into a natural environment, correct? And uh, so we should definitely remember that physical education is important. Um, exercise helps relieve the brain of stress, so forth, and being in nature also helps as well, walking with nature, communicating with God, those things. Mrs. White says that the time spent in physical exercise, 
A proportion of exercise of all the organs and faculties of the body is essential to the best work of each. When the brain is constantly taxed, while the organs of the living machinery are inactive, there is a loss of strength, physical and mental. The physical system is robbed of its healthful tone and the mind loses its freshness and vigor and a morbid excitability is the result. And we hear a lot about this at Weimar because, and I know you guys too, because you guys have heard about the frontal lobe, right? If the brain is constantly being taxed and it's under pressure, do you think the frontal lobe is gonna operate at peak capacity? Probably not. And our frontal lobe is necessary for making moral, spiritual decisions. So physical education, spiritual education helps with that. So definitely a very important aspect. And lastly, I'm not going to forget to mention mental education because this is it's kind of cool how everything, like I said, everything complements uh, the other. Each one complements the other. And um, while I was at Weimar, I really never thought of, you know, I knew that physical education, you know, it helps the mind. I knew that spiritual education is definitely an integral part of our lives as people, as students. And, uh, but I didn't think that, you know, I just thought that mental education was just there, you know, it was just floating by itself. And that's, that's not the case. It's, it's related to the others as well. So just as physical and spiritual education are connected to the mental aspect of education, mental education is also connected. Uh, through science, what do we learn about? We learn about our bodies. We learn about God's creation, botany, biology, anatomy and physiology. You learn about chemistry. And me personally, I, I said really, there's really, it's so hard to find a spiritual application in chemistry. And our, my teacher, I really, I'm really thankful now. But uh, I remember one of our first assignments was, uh, I need you to find uh, a chemistry illustration and apply a spiritual application to that. And I was like, what? You know, this, you can't really do that. I mean, it's chemistry and you know, you, you have, you know, I mean, God did create chemistry, but I don't know how that would work. And so I started thinking about it. And I said, well, God created the creation, right? So there must be a reflection of the creator in his creation, right? So we can definitely find those spiritual illustrations wherever it may be, in nature, creation, even in our subjects, chemistry, biology. Let me just give you uh, the illustration that I found real quick, um, wrapping up. Uh, so, and it's the illustration of salt. And you can find this in scripture as well, but it's kind of a different take on uh, ye are the salt of the world. It's uh, something that interested me a lot. And uh, I'm sure that you, you all are aware that salt can raise the boiling point or lower the melting point of water, which is why when you put salt on the roads, uh, ice melts. And uh, it does this because in ice, the molecules are really close together, like a pack of soldiers, you know, just all rigid. And um, however, there's like a really thin layer of water on the surface of the ice cube and we say that it's in equilibrium. All that means is that for every little bit of water that melts from the surface, some is being frozen. So it stays frozen like that. However, when you apply salt, it kind of wedges in between this equilibrium process. And so some can melt, but none can come back and become solid again. So they can't get close to one another in order to stay solid. So then it begins to melt. And I said, wow, that is interesting. Where in the Bible does it talk about salt? Well, obviously, God says that you are the salt of the world. And I always thought, hey, this is just because, you know, we're supposed to season up the scriptures. You know, we're supposed to really get in there with our daily lives and show people how a Christian should be, right? You know, just really give flavor to the scriptures. And that is obviously true. But at the same time, what if we are the salt that is applied to the icy hearts of people, and we begin to melt their hearts to be more receptive to the gospel, so that when somebody else comes along, that seed is more easily planted. And the water is already there because the ice melted. Very interesting, just so, so interesting. Something that, something that 
you can find in chemistry. It was so, it was so interesting to me. Um, so all of these things are intertwined with each other. And God definitely had a reason. When he gave us the blueprint for education, when he talked, uh, when he gave this through the spirit of prophecy, through the book Education, if you have some time, um, go back and maybe if you've already, I'm sure most of you have already read it, but go back and reread it and uh, identify some of, these, some of these aspects and ask yourself, am I incorporating these into my daily life? Because edu true education doesn't stop when you finish school. Maybe that be, whether that be a huge accomplishment like medical school or law school, it doesn't stop there. True education continues on forever. We will still be learning in heaven. We will still be having that physical aspect. God says that um, we will harvest what we have grown. There we will be tending to the animals, which same thing that happened in the Garden of uh, Eden. We'll be constantly in God's presence, spiritual education, learning about all the mysteries of Scripture. And the mental education, well, you have all of eternity for that. Go through um, astronomy, going to the stars, you know, biology, all these other things. I'm sure you'll find more concepts and spiritual applications than just salt. But you, it will definitely be a learning experience forever. And um, something that I encourage you, just take the time and incorporate it. Okay? That's all. So let's have a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful subject that you've given to us, education. Something that you planned and that you set up so that we might learn more about you, more about your creation, and establish your character within us. Lord, I ask that you will be with us throughout the rest of our week. Help us to um, meditate on uh, some of the things that were presented, and I, I pray that this has been a blessing for those who have listened, and, um, and all this I ask in Jesus' name, amen.